you know, I mean, you guys have been serving this industry for a lot of years. Um, what are some of the early lessons that you guys learned and how have they informed recent developments, even maybe future developments of, of what Desert Air uh, will be offering uh, this industry? Yeah, that was one of the things that we we did early on in our, our learning process. I mentioned our education of ourselves and our customers. We immediately on on the first units had put in uh, remote uh, cloud based logging systems and uh, alarm systems for the the customers and for us. So we made sure that the customers were aware. We were absolutely confidential with their information, but uh, we could uh, have it uploaded on a regular basis to our uh, our servers. And from there, we could see not only the operation of the equipment, but the operation of the rooms, what the loads were doing. So we could apply some of that uh, to, to their application and future product development and that type of scenario. I had spent uh, in that first couple of years, literally, first couple of years, probably thousands of hours looking at log data from individual grow rooms and trying to look at what we could do better, what could help that particular customer and so on and so forth. So that was a thing that we did really early on that was you know, just invaluable to the overall. What system. surprised you, Craig? Like the first time that you looked at a data set, what like was like, oh my God, I did not expect that. Yeah, that, that, change in humidity load i think you know i had done the research is one of those things where you looked at it and you knew it probably should happen and then you saw the spike in the transition in the photo period uh from the dark period to the photo period and then you got into the details and, and what i found was interesting that i didn't expect is the capacitance of the room in the system so you had this where the plants are reacting actually pretty quickly and they're starting to release the the moisture transpiring extremely rapidly uh it still takes a little bit of time but uh, uh, that's that's there but the room was if the set points were different between the dark and and the light period now you start to see a high latent load and there's a, a transition. You require a lot of air conditioning, uh, or at least a lot more than you did in the dark period, but not as much as you will later in the day. And the reasons why, especially if you have something like a concrete floor, huge amount of capacitance to that system where that's still cool for a long period of time. And we're trying to warm it up with the air and it's resisting, right? So it's it's warming up slowly. So you start to see not only this transition period, but also how the room affects that transition at the same time. That was one, uh, you know, I'm looking at the graphs and it's one of those head scratchers. And then after a while, you're like, this is why, you know, early in the day, you can see the difference required in the supplier temperature change as much as, well, I've seen it maybe four or five degrees difference between early in that photo period and late in that photo period because the concrete floor, the walls, they're still kind of resisting that change. Mm -hmm. So uh, have you seen difference? Did, did that, did you get curious and kind of look at the difference between a big voluminous room versus kind of these shorter ceiling rooms? Did you see a difference in how the room responded? Um, more of the materials of construction, but I did okay. see some differences in the room. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, definitely more about the, the materials that went into it. Um, yeah. And a little bit about how, uh, what temperatures and humidity they were uh, maintaining the interstitial space, as it were, the, the space just outside of the, the growing room environment. You saw a little bit of that impact going into it, but that was very interesting. And that led us down the path immediately of, all right, um, well, we had some photo cells in there. We wanted to understand when the lights were on or when they were off uh, and when they were you know, truly turned on, not just the growers told us that they turned the lights on at certain time of the day, right? So the equipment became equipped immediately with a photo cell that sensed when that happened. And then immediately after that, we said we could do some things with that information. And so if you're familiar with proportional integral derivative type of technology where we're going to modulate based on a, a PID loop, as we call it, right? We started to say we could take the PID loops that command the compressor capacity and the reheating capacity, and we could make them very quick when we know that that photocell change state from light to dark or dark to light. And that can help with this 
almost predictive, right? We know the load is going to change as soon as those lights turn off. We should respond quickly and we should operate within this range. And that was just a tremendous difference as we started to make those differences in the control sequences to say, here's where we should operate and we want to get there quickly. That type of thing. Interesting. How about outside air? You guys do specialize in, in DOAS units, uh, dedicated outside air systems for those of us who, those of my listeners who may not know, and, and indoor pool environments um, where it's kind of basically a, a, a DOAS unit, right? You have one entering airstream and one one discharge stream. Have you seen more interest or more requests for um, having the the capability to bring in outside air, either to meet minimum ventilation requirements, or maybe to try to use some sort of economizing to to manage the room. Yeah, that's a great question too. I've been waiting for that, Nadia, and really, it it hasn't happened mm. as of yet. Uh, we know that you know decoupling the load, we call it in in the case of dedicated outdoor air system. Essentially, that means treating the outside air, especially when it's hot and humid, before it comes to the space. That can be very energy efficient if we're going to use outside air. You get automatically uh, some uh, economizer functionality using dedicated outdoor air, and you might be able to modulate that air too at times, depending on the outdoor air conditions. So I've been waiting for all of that. In fact, I developed what I would call, you know, this optimal economizer sequence for the grow rooms that would look at enthalpy of the outside air, its dehumidification requirements relative to the indoor and so on. It's not rocket science, but it, it, it certainly, I put it there, on, you know, it's in my file on the corner of my desk for when that time came, when, when someone asked us for that. It really hasn't happened yet. I think, as you know, right, uh, we could probably do another hour-long podcast about it, but the growers have some concern. How would we do the filtration, keep the microbial load down, keep the fungal load down, all that type of scenario. And, and so far, uh, their, their response has been, Let's not even think about it. Let's let's not put in outside air if we don't have to. Yeah. Well, we should we should uh, compare notes, um, and it is something that we have started looking at um, and and recommending to especially our clients up north, where there are a lot of days, a lot of hours of the year where they could use the outside air as their primary means of dehumidification. Maybe not cooling. Uh, maybe they need to heat. Uh, so we need to make sure that we have enough auxiliary or supplemental heating um, on some of those days or many of those days in some cases. But it's certainly something that we've been looking at and, and able to convince um, some of our growers. And, you know, a lot of these growers are now, especially in the cannabis industry, I think the, the lettuce commodity growers have already sort of been there um, and are kind of setting some of those concerns aside, looking for ways to reduce their operational expenses. But, you know, there, there are a lot of regions um, in North America where we could use outside air as our, as our primary means of dehumidification, which we talked about is super energy intensive because we have to do all of this special heat transfer and latent heat transfer. So um, we'll talk after this about uh, <laughs> what where how we can make that happen with desert air equipment. Um, you've brought up a couple of times emerging tech, right? You've used this term. So I, I'm curious, you know, from your perspective, what the future of HVAC and humidity control for indoor plant environments looks like? What technology will we be seeing, um, you know, before we started and, uh, and we were talking, we were talking about the new refrigerants that are coming out, um, how that might impact, you know, the type of equipment that's available, the capacity, the efficiency, will the, will, will the past refrigerants be available in the future to, to maintain the charge for, for those existing equipment? Um, I mean, kind of whatever you want to talk about, like in terms of the future of HVAC for this industry. Yeah, well, we, we touched on it just briefly, but, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about has been direct expansion, direct uh, dehumidification, uh, direct refrigerant coils. Uh, the other side of the industry is certainly a water-based uh, method or fluid-based method of moving the heat around, right, where we might have what uh, it's still an integrated HVAC units dedicated to the, the plant environment. 
but it could use water or glycol to be able to cool the air coming down and then reheat that air as well. Um, how we would do that then is there would be a, a water coil that was a cold water coil and then a hot water coil inside the, the uh, integrated HVAC system. And there would be a chiller, preferably a heat recovery chiller, so that we could use that same methodology where that energy we use to cool the air got back into the system. In this case, it's water instead of refrigerant and then is able to be used for reheating when necessary, all right? So we could selectively reheat the air in the same way. So the air sees the same path or sees the this, this same kind of conditioning, but we do it in a different method where that chiller is the primary piece uh, to do, to create the, the cold water in this case, instead of necessarily directly the cold air. Why well, I think that's important as we go forward you mentioned things like, uh, how could we increase reliability, even of compressors? In the case of these chilled water systems, we have a lot of capacitance as well. We're, we're serving multiple rooms. Uh, we've got lots of stages of compressors available, but especially uh, we don't have to turn them on and off quite as often uh, because we can chill that water and, and uh, we can have smaller stages and so on. So point being is it can be a little more stable operation for that compressor potentially. We have to be very careful about this because uh, anytime we transfer energy from one source or to a sink, we it's never perfect heat exchange. There's losses in doing so. So this introduces another potential you know, source and sink and depending on how large we size that heat exchanger, there can be a loss there, but we can make up for that in the economy of scale the compressors themselves can be really efficient. They can have many more stages. Uh, you could imagine if you wanted to have each room have a, uh, a variable speed driven compressor or two variable speed driven compressors uh, and, and two units in that room and you wanted to have multiple stages, all of a sudden you have 200 refrigeration systems, that becomes very complex, very expensive. But if we can take that economy of scale and do a chiller system, now we have more options. It can still be a little more expensive. There are some moving parts there, but uh, we, another way we can make up for that to kind of directly go back to your other question about economizers. Now what we could do in those regions that are relatively cold is we can do what's called a free cooling chiller. And a free cooling chiller has a coil that sits out in the ambient condition when, when it's cold instead of turning on the compressor to make and, and move the energy, all we have to do is exchange the energy with that water loop to the outside coil. And that can be tremendous, right? So if it's say 35 degrees, maybe it has to be 30 degrees or so, we don't have to exchange air from the outside to do economizer. We can do a water-based economizer. We circulate that with just a pump, not a compressor, and we circulate it through the free cooling chiller and bring that back to units. And then that is the source of the cooling. So now we're doing economizing without doing that exchange of the microbial load and the fungal load and, and all the contaminants from the outside yeah. air. And so I think that's something that we need to look at to your point before, you know, what's the right application for each one of the technologies? Is this right for this particular customer? I think usually that's going to be someone with a larger facility because they can now look at the economy of scale. It starts to become less of a delta in cost relative to uh, some DX systems. And, and so it starts to make a lot of sense from that perspective. So I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask bringing using the terminology economy of scale I do have sort of a number in mind, like what would be the square footage of canopy or square footage of a facility that you would think that would have the right economy of scale to go towards that centralized system? Yeah. Um, you Did you say you have a, a number? That, well, I mean, up? I have a number I usually <laughs> think of, but I'm curious what your number might be. Well, I would be trying to push that low because you talked about uh, some of the things, as, as we said, the, uh, the, the durability, the robustness of the equipment, the keeping it in the, the optimal zones and so on. And I think that's important. I think the control, because with water, essentially we've got an infinite turn down and we don't have to worry about cycling on, cycling off. So we can start to move a water valve and, and move it down to its lowest loads. 
So to me, there's an economy aspect and there's also a performance and, and a durability aspect of things here we need to consider. And so my number, as far as uh, I'll put it in tons and I'll try to try to push that into a uh, square footage. So uh, perhaps somewhere in the range of uh, 600 to 800 tons is where it starts to make a, a bunch of sense. And even a little lower at times, if we're really concerned about the control aspect of things. And that uh, would be roughly a facility 20 to 30,000 square feet, something like that, you know, multiple rooms, uh, and, and probably a little bit less than that, in fact. I'm using my calculator. <laughs> <laughs> they, they can't see you, Nadia. You didn't have to fess up to that. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, I would actually, I would agree with that scale. Um, you know, yeah, something greater than 500 tons is, is what I would expect. And, you know, one of the things with, with, with chillers, you know, we were talking about like sort of these three different types of systems and sort of that decoupled split system. And, and, and when I say split system, you know, what I really mean, right, is like a split DX or split heat pump air conditioner type of system with the standalone dehumidifiers. Like that's fairly, I'll just call it low tech. Right. I mean, you know, even though standalone dehumidifiers, you can sort of plug into 120 volt, right. Like outlet and, you know, fairly easy to to maintain or or cost effective to to throw in the garbage and replace. Right. Uh, <laughs> not, that, not that I'm advocating for that, but uh, then you have like the package system more complex. Right. You have service techs, you know, on board that you've contracted with. Um, you can do a lot of so sort of the regular ongoing maintenance with your team. But when I started thinking about like centralized systems with chillers and boilers and pumps and valves and right like you're adding you're multiplying all these components together that are more complex larger more you you need them to be more reliable because you know it's like one thing with the, with maybe a package system or these split systems they're kind of room by room usually now we have a central system which is whole building usually multiple rooms. And so we don't want a chiller to go down right now. You have a redundant chiller um, as opposed to just a little redundant, you know, packaged unit or something. Yeah. And so in that case, usually uh, one of the things that I look for when even thinking about recommending a, a central plant based system is do they have a facilities engineering team, right? Mm -hmm. A facilities team that the, you know, that can support, all of these systems that it's not the grower and the grow team that are, you know, trying to muddle through some of these failures or downtimes and stuff, but you really need now a team. You need somebody who has their eye on that system more often than not. Right. It's not, it's not a set it and forget it type of system usually. Yeah, you're right. And yeah, I don't, don't want to mislead anyone that there's, there's no free lunch there. Uh, with those chiller, I, I would always recommend at least a modular system. So they make modular chillers where uh, you're stacking up individual modules and they can work if one section goes down. You can work on that for that matter while the other portion of the system is running. Redundant pumps, making sure that you have still a couple of the integrated HVAC units per room so that if you had a fan issue or a leak on, on one or one of the circulating pumps is, is an issue, you have to think about that tip to tail. Um, you know, where is my redundancy? It's a little bit easier to think about that when you talk about direct DX systems or, as you mentioned, the, the portables, right? Uh, there is a, there's an advantage there. You, you have 15 per room now. I don't know how you coordinate set points of all those, but it, the advantage is I had one go. I've lost one fifteenth of my capacity. I, I hardly notice, right? Something to that effect. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying 15 is always the, the number, but it can be as many as, as that. And so it, there's advantage there. Again, the re-evaporation that occurs if you turn off a compressor in one of those small systems, it's tremendous. You, you lose energy efficiency and you don't know it is essentially what happens because, you know, as much as you've had that redundancy, you also don't notice that you've cycled and lost capacity as that coil was cold. Um, it collected a lot of moisture. It, some of it had drained down. Some of it was collected on the coil itself. Now we turn it off and very rapidly there's re-evaporation that occurs. 
on those portables, you don't quite notice as, as much. And that can be a detriment because all of a sudden your one system is cycling over here, another one's cycling over here. Uh, and all your room doesn't change much, but you're adding additional load and you're not doing as much capacity as, as you thought you were. So my and they're point fighting is, each other a lot yep. of times. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I don't, I was trying to say that there's advantages there too, to the portables uh, and disadvantages, but one of them is, you know, this kind of diversity factor that you get with them and, and so on. So we need to think about that. Uh, there's this theory uh, of uh, N plus one. Uh, it, that what we mean by that is we have as many modules of a system, whatever they look like, or many components of the system where if we lose one, uh, we still have enough capacity for to, to handle the load. So we don't notice we can do maintenance or we can do service on one of those pieces because we've got one more module than we needed uh, in that. And there's also the concept of, uh, I'll, I'll call it N minus one. How much do we notice if one of the systems goes down? That's a good thought process in this industry because we don't can't always afford another chiller, another module. So we have to think about what happens if that one goes down and how much will we notice and how quickly we can get it back online. Hmm. Do you do you see a future for heat pumps in this industry? Um, it's a good question. I, I've been asked this before. And I don't think so. <laughs> so really? here's, yeah, here's the reason why. Uh, uh, so in the air conditioning world, really the heat pump, right, is a, an air conditioner that can reverse its cycle and we can heat or we can cool, right? So there's that uh, dehumidification effect of cooling the air, but now we have to find some way to reheat that. And that's okay. You can do that. You could construct a heat pump or a reverse cycle system that also maybe could have a reheat coil in it uh, that uses hot gas reheat. Now, the other aspect of things is it could be a geothermal heat pump. And this is the one question that I get probably the most. Um, I'm going to absorb the energy from the air and reject at least a portion of it into a geothermal loop. And that is a, something that's attached to the ground typically. Um, it could be attached to another source um, that uh, is gonna be able to absorb and reject energy into that, uh, that ground coupled system. Now, why I don't think that it'll, it'll often come to pass is that we need to reject so much more energy than we need to absorb. And what'll happen to the well that we, we create to do a, a ground source or ground coupled system, I should call it, or the field as it were. Now, really we're not absorbing and rejecting energy at, you know, kind of infinitely. The ground is a battery, we're storing energy. And if we put too much into it, now we're not gonna be able to put enough into it again. So geothermal systems, ground coupled geothermal systems need to be balanced between their source and sink so that they're absorbing energy at the same rate that re they're rejecting energy into that, that loop. There's an exception there. If you had something like a river or stream or even a large lake, uh, that can be almost an infinite sink for the energy that we absorb. So if we do this, we're going to have to think about those aspects and we're going to have to figure out how we're going to overcome those obstacles with a, a ground coupled geothermal system. Well said. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also spent a lot of time uh, answering that question. I mean, if you you live in a locate, you know, maybe a greenhouse because then you would need cooling and heating, mm -hmm. right. At different times of the year, but yeah, indoor, we're always trying to reject heat, right. Mm -hmm. We're very rarely trying to add heat. And if we are adding heat, it's usually in a small, a minuscule amount compared to how much we're rejecting. So yeah, like you said, we're just loading the battery and, and never taking anything from it. You know, here in California, uh, I know you're aware of our new energy code. You know, how do you see that impacting, if at all, uh, the future of HVAC or, or even just controlled environment agriculture in general? Do you see other energy codes coming on in other parts of the country? I mean, I guess I already know the answer to that question, but <laughs> I'm going to ask you it anyway. And, you know, yeah, just what is that? What is the impact going to be on, on you guys uh, trying to serve this industry better? 
Yeah, that's a good question, too. I, I, this might be a little late to the game. Everyone probably knows this, too, but LED lights are an important piece of this puzzle, right? So the radiant heat component of LED lights is so much less than than the uh, HID technologies out there, sodium vapor, metal halide, that, you know, that we get more efficiency when it comes to output per sensible load, per extra heat that we need to deal with. And so that's it's not only an efficiency of the lighting per se, it's more uh, PPFD, right, uh, per watt, but also for the HVAC equipment. So we have to continue down that path as uh, LED lights are, are going to uh, be an important part of it. Now, how that impacts the industry from a, a load standpoint, the dehumidifier standpoint is we've taken care of that additional heat that's gone in there, but the plants are still transpiring at the same rate. So now we have to focus even more on moisture removal efficiency. Uh, it, it, you'll hear the term MRE, right? That's going to be the moisture removal efficiency, the amount of capacity of water we make per kW hour that we put in in terms of energy. So we now, we before we had to push a lot about sensible, the air conditioning component you might might look at sear right the seasonal energy efficiency ratios uh, of an air conditioner and say that's that's what i need to focus on now we're going to be focusing much more on moisture removal efficiency when it's leds because that's going to be the largest load uh, without a doubt when we have an led it's going to be about moisture and trying to wring it out of the air so some of the things that we can do is look at technologies that can enhance the, the latent ca capacity. It, it basically increases the MRE of the systems. And uh, there's there's a couple technologies out there that can help do that. So that'll be a focus for us and I think for the industry moving forward. Yeah, I'm 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 looking forward to that and, and interesting interested to see what um, what comes out of that and um, even how I hope HVAC manufacturers uh, lead that conversation, right? Get ahead maybe of the conversation is the right way to put it, you know, for, for those of you listening, you know, the new California energy code, at least in terms of HVAC for indoor grows, not necessarily greenhouses uh, require 75% uh, heat recovery uh, during the dehumidification process for, you know, these package DX systems for chiller systems. And, you know, there's already talk about pushing that up to 90%. And, you know, talk about what, what can they do even beyond just heat recovery. Um, so, so I'm curious to see where that will, will go. Yeah, good. <laughs> so, you know, just to sort of wrap up, if, if we're talking to the engineers or if we're talking even to the technicians, what advice do you have for them, for engineers and contractors who are specifying HVAC equipment for an indoor grow facility? Yeah, well, I would say, you know, if you don't have someone that uh, on staff that uh, is an engineer or a contractor who has done this before, uh, get in contact with someone who has done this several times, right? This is unique, right? So people like Nadia, definitely, right? Uh, who's, who's been around this, who understands the biology, who understands the, the HVAC systems and how they interact. It's just so critical uh, because it is different. And so we want to make sure we get the loads right. We want to make sure we're selecting the right equipment. And that's that's no small task in this kind of unique application, as it were. Um, otherwise, you know, pay attention, especially to the, the loads. Um, size the equipment right. You made a good point, uh, Nadia. We love safety factors. Uh, as and, and engineers and designers. And what ends up happening is we add a safety factor here and then uh, we add a safety factor on top of that. So we, we, we've added a safety factor on our load perhaps. And then we've added a safety factor on the equipment size. And then we thought they may increase the size of the facility later. So we had to, to accommodate that with equipment as well. And all of a sudden we've got a system that's not fit for the purpose exactly because it's been uh, sized for something that wasn't true. I would say, you know, take a step back, make sure that you have all of those, those pieces aligned and, and so on. And, and look at the equipment. You know, I, I think the controls aspect is really interesting. We could, we could probably spend another two hours as well on controls because 
you know, in this particular environment, we need to make sure that it, the controls can respond quickly to the loads that they're, they're responding to the right thing. Um, just one example, if for humidity load, what do we care about as growers? We look at the VPD a lot of times, right? The vapor pressure deficit, and we want a temperature and a vapor pressure deficit. Sometimes we express that in terms of a temperature and RH, but that's interesting for the equipment because the equipment, the RH is relative. It's, it's right in the name, right? So relative humidity is relative to the temperature. The equipment, for example, might need to respond to something different. So, so one thing that we do is look at the dew point. That's the, the total moisture content of the air. That's independent of the RH uh, and temperature. It's, it's relative to both if you look at a psychometric chart, but it's it's the total moisture content of the air. And uh, you know, having the, the controls to be able to respond to the right aspects of things is, is really, really important. So pay attention to that. Make sure you not only have the right equipment, but you have the right controls. Yeah, I almost purposely have avoided asking controls questions because I do know that that would take us off down a huge rabbit hole and tangent, which is an important one to talk about. And if you are willing to come back to talk about that, I'd love to, because um, I know there's a lot of things that you guys have done over the years to improve that. You guys provide a sensors and monitoring and controls package with your equipment and, and not everybody does. Um, so I appreciate that that's, that comes standard uh, with what you guys provide. So, um, and, and thank you, by the way, you get the ding, ding, ding for, for saying vapor pressure deficit, my favorite term. <laughs> Even under the wire on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Just snuck it in. Good job. <laughs> so, so final question, what do plants crave from technology? Yeah, that's that's a great question too, Nadia. Uh, the plants they need the great environment to survive and thrive, right? So every aspect of it is important. Uh, but what plants want from HVAC technology in particular is something to be able to control and respond to changes. But in the end, uh, plants don't care too much about your iPhone. They don't care too much about your computer. It's up to us to leverage the technology to give them what they want. Um, and, and that's important, right? But I think it's an important uh, distinction as well, where let's utilize the, the technology. Uh, let's get the least amount of energy possible given our budget. But uh, let's remember the plants care about the environment and not exactly how we're gonna get there. So let's be creative about technology and let's uh, let's leverage it for energy efficiency and so on and and give the plants what they want. And that's that's just a space to grow. That's awesome. So. All right, Craig, I got I got a few rapid fire questions for you. So they're just meant to be real quick answers, a sentence or two. If you want to expand on anything, of course, you can. But uh, unscripted here. All right. Are you ready? Yeah. OK. Are uh -oh. plants. <laughs> 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 now you really got to put your thinking cap on. All right. Yeah. Are plants high tech or low tech? I think plants are high tech. Uh, if I explain very briefly why, I'm mm -hmm. just amazed about their ability to adapt to their environment. Um, just, you know, we're talking about stomata and, and how they can, you know, close under certain conditions. They've, they've really obviously adapted themselves, you know, throughout, evolved themselves uh, throughout uh, history. Uh, but I think they're high tech in the way that they can, uh, they can control their own response to, to the environment. Love that. What is one piece of advice you'd give to a new grower? Oh, that's a good question. I would say to get a good understanding of all aspects of the technology that's going to go into your environment. Um, obviously the growers, their main focus is going to be how we can get those plants to be as productive as possible or grow as healthy as possible. Uh, but they have to have a good understanding of this HVAC side and they, they have a, a good understanding of, of the lighting side. It's part of the part of things that happen certainly there. I would say, uh, just look at it uh, tip to tail, the HVAC, the lighting, the uh, irrigation systems, just understand the technology tip to tail. Nice. What have indoor plant environments taught you? 
indoor plant environments have taught me um, that, well, I suppose I need to be adaptable in my way that I go about my work a little bit more as well. I mentioned mm -hmm. I was so excited to see something, some brand new. And, uh, you know, I, I maybe had things figured out in a lot of different ways when it came to applications. And, uh, you know, I've done a lot of work uh, on new and different in the past, everywhere from a small uh, whole home dehumidification unit to a large uh, piece of HVAC equipment that could decontaminate an airplane, if you could imagine that. But this was brand new, and it taught me that uh, I need to look at things with with an open mind and certainly know mm -hmm. that uh, we're always learning, we're always adapting, but I, I need to make sure that uh, I'm open to new things. Nice, nice. That's a good, your answer is a good segue to my next question. If you could design or select a dehumidification system for any application other than indoor plant environments, what would it be? Interesting. I'm not sure what it is, Nadia. I guess I will say uh, the next thing is what I want to design the uh, HVAC Ooh. system for. Yes. So it's it's not known to us right now what that application is. It was like indoor plant environments were some 15 years ago or so, mm -hmm. where we don't know what it is. I would like to be on that forefront of understanding what it is and creating a system to uh, efficiently approach that. I love that answer. Okay, last question. Which tool do you use the most? A ruler, a calculator, or a psychrometric chart? I think you know the answer to this question. <laughs> I'm hoping I do. <laughs> yes, no, psychrometric chart uh, every day of the week. Uh, you know, it's uh, there's probably 10 of them on my desk, and, and <laughs> yeah. some are marked and some are not marked up uh, because this this is the, the, the technology. This is the way we measure moist air properties, right? So it is so integral to dehumidification and the indoor plant environment. Uh, use it to understand the sensible heat ratio, the loads of the space, but also uh, how that coil is going to operate in the evaporator coil or the reheat coil and so on. So it's just used every day. Uh, I think it's probably been almost, uh, you know, 20 years that I have touched a psychometric chart almost every day. Yeah, it is definitely my favorite tool of the trade. Craig, thank you so much for the conversation. Um, thank you for taking that technical deep dive uh, into HVAC and refrigeration cycles with me. Uh, this was really fun. And, and I learned a few things talking to you today. That's great. Uh, I, I, I hope so. I know you, uh, you know this stuff, uh, Nadia, but uh, thank you so much for having me. I hope your listeners uh, kind of uh, can appreciate some of it. And I hope I didn't uh, go too far into the weeds. But uh, in any case, it was just always a pleasure to speak with you. And, and I appreciate the time. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Craig. All right. That's it. Cool. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Craig. I hope you got to talk about all the things you wanted to talk about. I mean, there's like this could be a four-hour conversation, right? No doubt. Um, when I, I had lots of notes about chillers.